Mass and Dawn by Harold Lang. We're in chapter nine of part two, The Woman of Damascus. Our spouse is supposed to be a sort of tranquility for each other. I mean, you don't expect them to make you happy, per se, but so. Uh, or at least you shouldn't expect to rely on other people to be the only, uh, you know, to be the contingent on your well-being. But um, definitely the tranquility between the spouses. The quick-witted dilemma noticed this, and he quoted a verse describing the loneliness of the king Manelaus behind the seas, or beyond the seas. So much he grieves, this queen beyond the seas, this phantom queen will walk with his halls and guide him on the winged path of sleep. Yet the army as a whole was pleased that he had taken Bersina into his tent. Alexandros did not find it so easy a matter to dispose of the question of women in the army camps. Probably Alexandros never understood Bersina. Well, who fully understands another, right? Before him, she had known a brave and shrewd man, Memdon of Parodz, a state builder who had not been had nonetheless given his loyalty to the great king. The Macedonians had respected Memnon. Now they had no such respect for Dreyavosh, who had left his army, his women, and his weapons behind him when he had become afraid. Well, don't bring your women along as cheerleaders either to battles, either of us, you know. Greatly as Alexandros had been afraid in the chill anxiety of stress, he knew now that he would never turn and run to escape. The force driving him on towards danger was inflexible. It was greater than his own dread or foreboding. Not that Barsina shared such thoughts. There was little in Alexandros for her to share. Before sunup, he made sacrifice alone at the rocks outside the pavilions overlooking the sea when he flung himself down in the tent entrance to eat grapes and barley cake. Officers would be sitting around to talk to him. When he took his stand outside a gemma post, bareheaded in the sun's warmth, there would be groups of soldiers or country people with charges and pleas and petitions for Alexandros when he first entered a country, made a point of hearing civilian cases as well as the military matters of routine. By discovering the problems of individuals, he thought he, could be, they, he thought that he could begin to understand the needs of the country. No lawman appeared to argue at such times, nor did spokesmen present the views of a class, because rights belong to the individual, who must accordingly explain his own good point of view. Most men here could speak Greek, are the universal coin. And the language my stomach speaks is that it's hungry, as it growls. Those who spoke only Aramaic or the Semitic dialects brought interpreters. Even when no officers or petitioners stood before the tents, Barsina did not find that the Macedonian idol. He dictated letters to a young Greek as swiftly as he had heard the judgment cases. Once he made a decision, it passed from his mind, but he kept a multitude of details in his memory. After receiving the list of treasures stored at Damascus, he sent 800 talents back to Aristotle for the expense for the expenses of the philosopher's new lacume, and he picked out a hundred weight of precious myrrh to send to Leonidas, his first tutor. He dictated a letter so that you, Leonidas, 
will not need to skimp the offering to the gods. It seemed that ten years ago, Leonidas had censored Alexandros for throwing too much incense on the embers. Another tutor, Lysimachus, now gray in the beard, had come along with the scientists. Although his only skill lay in reading Greek, Alexandros left the old man Potter among the manuscripts that filled a chest in their sleeping room. Sometimes at night he had Lysimachus read from Ascalus while he laid outstretched. His muscles relaxed. Usually he did not sleep until after the middle of the night. It's better to just say ritual in the dusk and go to sleep for the whole of the middle of the night, but um, you know, if people are being loud at you right before bed, it doesn't really work that way. But it's, you know, doing these programs and stuff like this that uh, is being opposed. It's, it's not a problem to anyone. No one's, see, here, no one's disturbing it, but There were mornings after a rest period in camp when Alexandros lay with his head buried in his arms, oblivious, until the heat of noon, being drunk with fatigue, not with wine. Barsina noticed that these spells of oblivion came after a quiet day, not upon the march or the Macedonians, when they were debating important problems. At such times, she would not wake him. When marching, you know, it's good to be awake between sunrise and dawn, which is on average about an hour and a half before, at least for a minute, to get up, physically get up, do a ritual for a few minutes, and then go, go back to bed, that's fine. But when marching, he would not use shaded litter. Usually he walked, passing from one unit to another, talking with the men, or he took bows and rode off to the side to hunt game. When he was in the chariot, he liked to practice jumping on and off at a full gallop, yet he did not like to watch violence in games. Barsina noticed that when a budget of letters came from distant Macedon, he opened first those from Antipater, smiling as he read, laying them aside carelessly. The missives from Olympias, his mother, would, have, would let no one else see except occasionally a silent shadow, Hephaestion, and then he touched Hephaestion's lips afterwards with a seal ring so that the other would speak no word of what he had read. Barsina understood from the talk of the men that Antipater, the military regent in Macedon, complained as bitterly of Olympias as the queen mother complained of Antipater. Doesn't the fool know, Alexandros burst out once, that all his argument avails nothing against one tear of a mother? This sudden impatience with people frightened Barsina a little because Alexandros did not seem to be irritated by accidents or failure. He was very patient when things went wrong, but people could anger him quickly and seriously when they failed to do what he had expected. He had a way of looking at them his open blue eyes, questioning. My eyes used to be bluer. Not, ama not amused or puzzled, as if stripping away the mask of their flesh and thinking nothing of their words, but searching for what was hidden in them, as if he searched for something more than human flesh. And, finding it, became angered or pleased. He could be deceived easily by a clever lie, but he could not be deceived so easily as to the inner nature of men whom he had met face to face, the quick-witted, caustic, and unscrupulous Ptolema, son of Lagus, tricked Alexandros often into doing things, and Alexandros must have known it, yet he trusted Ptolema with more and more responsibility, while the most brilliant of the companion officers, Philatus, 
son of Parmenio, who went about with an escort of aides and experts like a small monarch, and carried out orders faultlessly. When this Philatus left him, Barsina observed how he struggled with uncertainty and voiceless anger. Outwardly, he treated both officers, both officers alike. Inwardly, he seemed to feel that the dilemma could do no wrong, not even when he paraded a new mistress, shining with gems and silks, in his chariot, while Philatus could do nothing wrong. Barsina thought that Ptolema, who might have fought, been fathered by Philip, was a dangerous rival, more dangerous as Alexandros's power increased, whereas Philatus was the son of Parmenio, his loyalty only an insane man would have questioned. She wondered if Alexandros was actually as sane as other men, or perhaps so insane that he really was the sanest of them all. Who knows? Um, once, when she had put on a trinket given her by a slave on a feast day, a twisted snake of green copper, Alexandros had torn it off her arm the instant he saw it. He had hurt her hand, and he had thrown it off the rocks of the shrine, down into the surf. Nor did he make any excuse to her for doing it. Reminded him of his mother, probably. After that, she was afraid that Alexandros would discover her own secret. The only evidence of that secret lay concealed in a miniature ivory gem case, not locked with a key but cleverly held shut by a hidden catch. In this case, she kept with her more intimate possessions and never opened it unless alone in the tent, when moonlight allowed her to look into the case without the risk that other eyes might see what it held. After throwing away the snake, Alexandros brought her another bracelet of gold set with moonstones. Without any snakes, this Barsina wore daily to please him, although she used no other jewelry, even the fillet binding her brown hair was no more than a band of gilded leaves. Alexandros noticed that. Then they brought him the casket. Some soldiers offered it as a gift because it had tiny figures of winged royal heads on it, and they thought it fitting for him, jesting with them he asked what precious thing they had in mind that he should keep in this fine casket, and when they laughed, suggesting this and that, he took up an old manuscript book of the Iliad that he had kept near his bed and declared he had nothing more precious than that, and it fitted into the new casket nicely. But Barsina felt brightened because, like herself, Alexandros kept no private store of valuables about him. Usually he gave away the carved gems and gold images that came into his hands, nor did he make use of the ray of Ouch's ornamented pavilions or the gold plate silver or the gold plate service, only using the onx bath because he liked it, and said it reminded him of Isis. Well a lot of very good leaders in the past operated much under those same principles that Focus not on acquiring wealth as a leader, but distribute them as charity or otherwise. You definitely have more alliance. That's part of why Alexandros was a, a, mag, a magus or mag. No, I don't remember how to say the great at the moment. Um. So when Alexandros placed the silver casket near his couch, Barsina tried to keep the small gem case out of his sight. What it held was most precious to her. Whether he observed that she concealed the case, she could not tell. But one evening, when the lamps were lighted, she found him poised over her corner of the sleeping tent where her clothes chest stood and her where her clothes chest stood and her combs, bronze mirror, 
and slippers arranged except for ointments, boxes, and fibula, and a little terracotta model of a ship. Barcina possessed nothing more. She did not want to have about her now what she had be had before, because those things of the past grieved her. But she had not been able to part with the things hidden within the case. Alexandros lifted the veil, covering the ivory box, holding it lightly in his fingers. He gazed at it, his body still. His fingers moved, searching for a lock. It holds no poison. Barcina smiled at him. For you are for me. At once, his eyes probed her, looking through her face, which he knew so well, seeking for what lay hidden within her. She felt as if he pulled a veil away from her, and was looking inside her body, angered. She thought of words she might say, and then she reached forward and pressed the corner of the case. Inside gleamed the precious things set in order, the armbands, the miniature tiara and earrings, and all the personal jewelry of a woman, each piece inscribed with minute letters, the love of Memnon of Rhodes. Alexandros examined a bracelet of thin silver, put it back, closed the lid, and gave her the case. You need not wear the bracelet of Alexandros of Macedon, he said, and went away, seemingly forgetting her secret from that moment. But when months later, he began his journey to the east. He did not take Barcina, the widow of Memnon. Still, he had been influenced by this woman who had first shared his life physically. She had been a woman of the east, not a Macedonian. Alexandros had spent months on the Syrian coast during the second winter, watching the sea, unable to go out on it. He studied it, the fishing craft using nets inshore, the war and merchant fleets, passing far out against the sunset, avoiding the shore now that he occupied it, for the Syrian coast was his. It stood against the far-off snow of the mountains. It murmured pleasantly, where streams flowed down to the towns, almost touching each other. To the small harbors, man-made along the coast road, through the camel, mule, and cart caravans, the drivers often singing in the warm winter sun, the Macedonian coast, been mistbound, almost deserted. This shore, this shore was both a garden and a gateway to a whole world. There had been no more than forests and barbarian folk behind the Macedonian shore. Behind him here, millions of human beings wandered over trade routes, climbed to aid shrine sh summits, and led their children through the streets and the more Immorably, immemorally old. The rocks where he sacrificed were marked with figures that had never been made by Greek hands. This coast had changed masters, but it had not changed its nature like the chores of Greece. No. Let us remember that Zulkarnain, Zulkarnain in Aramea was not Alexander the Great. In the limestone cliffs, he saw where quarries could take out the stone. In the river beds, where clay could be taken for pottery. In the groves of the Lebanon, the trees stood tall and straight ready, shaped by natural growth, were long ships and great houses. Already his workmen were taking out the stone and timber on sledges down the Tura. These things Alexandros saw because his fathers had been tribal chieftains, ordering the planting of crops and breeding of animals, ministering to sickness and compensating for death by violence among the folk who served them. 
Alexandros studying the strange coast with patient eyes, thought of what could be built and what could be grown here, where his ancestors had never ventured. He thought of the needs of human beings and the use of things, not of plans or laws. A barbarian himself, he'd been taught in Aristotle's school to rely upon natural forces as he could shape them, and not upon abstract ideas. In the natural world, nothing exists without a purpose, if that purpose could be known. Now, the Greeks kind of shifted away from art with a purpose to art for itself or art for aesthetical, oh, just try to make it beautiful. Um, other cultures conveyed something or dedicated something. This was religious, scientific, more than... The months after Isis had freed him from his worst anxieties, the gold reserves and valuables found at Damascus allowed him to send more treasure home and to support his expedition here for a year or so. Volunteers have come in, numerous enough, to make good his losses, and he no longer had to play the part of a captain general of Hellas. Moreover, ambassadors had arrived from the great king, bringing a weak bargaining letter and adding their pleas to it. They had asked the Macedonian to cease injuring the countries of Asia and to agree to a peace with the great king and to return to him his family. I am here as commander and chief of all the Greeks, Alexandros had written in answer, because your agents insisted because your agents instigated the murder of my father and corrupted my friends, you send money to the Spartans to create enmity against me and dissolve the league of which I am head. You say the battle was decided by the will of the gods. Well, Thoreavaus would have, like a Christian, pretended to be monotheist, but all the angels and for Bashis and the, the, the Ahuras and the Yazatas and the Fravashis and stuff were obviously. Um, then I'm here in possession of your lands by the will of the gods. I am protecting the men of yours who came to me of their own free will. As my father was killed, so was Arses, the ruler of this land, killed by you, a usurper, in violation of the laws of the Persians and Metis. You know, it wasn't too many generations before where the Persians were divided into those two kingdoms, right? Hence the two horns. Come to me then and ask for your mother, your wife, and your children. Ask for what you will, and it shall be granted, and you shall be safe. Only come and ask of the king of Asia, who is no longer your equal, but lord of your lands. If you dispute this, you can fight another battle, but do not run away, for wherever you are, I intend to march against you. He instructed his envoys to deliver the letter, but not to talk about it. He did not think it would add to Darius's, uh, Dariavash's peace of mind. I, I don't, Darius is probably proper Greek. I don't, that sounds Greek enough, but that's not how you say his name. Because in Persian, you're going to say the B instead of the Wa. So, uh, Dar Al Ush, you know, it's not quite how you would say it. But I don't remember the Persian. How, how, what's the Persian spelling of it? I know I have it in this room. The staff devoted some thought to Doray Vouch's state of mind. War they knew to be merciless, but war embraced more than any clash of armed forces. War could be controlled by human minds, so that success or failure depended upon human minds. That is, upon such qualities of mind as the will to resist, or to attack, or to endure. Had not these very Persians sapped the will of the Greeks by feeding them luxuries? Did not this great king still controlled the seas because he had made it more profitable 
of the Phoenicians, Capiratus, and Rhodians to collaborate with him and to preserve their own independence in trade, had not the brilliant Greek generals learned the value of treachery and tricks, what else had been the famous wooden horse that the Trojans themselves hauled into the, into the gate of Troy? It was both easier and more saving of life to attack an enemy's state of mind than to advance against an enemy's horsemen. Antigonus had developed a whole technique of intimidation and deception, and Ptolemy was proving an apt pupil. Only Alexandros seemed backward in grasping this new method of warfare. Alexandros went along, daydreaming about building, intent on exploring until he was caught in difficulties. Then he fought his way out brilliantly. It was almost as if he believed in fate. In this war against the mind of the Reifausch, the state, uh, the, the staff, and the philosophers had been at great pains to earn the friendship of the Syrian coast. Here no traitors have been executed, and our prisoners confined to labor. No payments have been, le been levied on the rich cities, which insisted, which instead were now free to choose their own form of government. Volunteers were honorably received, even the captive family of the Reifausch was treated with exactly the same honor as had been theirs by right. Only the Reifausch was held up to scorn, and the open letter sent him after receiving that letter, and not being allowed to discuss it with the envoys, Dreyavash could have only two possible alternatives open to him, to come back to the coast to give battle with the new army, or to separate himself entirely from the coast. Never venturing hither again, Alexandros had agreed perfectly with the wording of this letter. In fact, he had phrased it himself. Parmenio, Antigonus, and Ptolemy guessed which alternative the Reifausch would take. They based their guess on the facts of the so-called great king of Asia. That the so-called great king of Asia fled helplessly from the Macedonians in battle, and that the captivity of his family must be tormenting him. So they expected him to surrender all the Mediterranean coast, to get his family back, and to secure Macedonian recognition that he was indeed the great king of the vastly greater eastern portion of his dominion. The event proved them right, but shrewder minds than theirs had reasoned otherwise in Tor, and now Tor resisted them. And my stomach is growling at opportune times, but um, right or wrong, well, yeah, obviously there's some there's not really a moral high ground, and there's usually not a moral high ground in war, so let's, let's uh, play that game, shall we?